Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Aaron Giroux, Professor of Film Studies and East Asian Languages and Literatures at Yale University. Professor Giroux teaches courses in Japanese cinema and popular culture, film studies and film genre, as well as seminars on Japanese film and cultural theory. He has published numerous articles and books in English, Japanese, and other languages on such topics as Japanese early cinema, film theory, contemporary directors, genre, censorship, and cinematic representations of minorities. Today we talk with him about the history of Japanese film theory. Welcome, Professor Giroux. Uh, thank you very much for having me. So you are in the process of um, mm. writing a book on the history of Japanese film theory. Yes. What led you to undertake that endeavor? Well, I mean, it's a rather esoteric topic. Usually when I try to explain it to people, they kind of scratch their heads at first, mm -hmm. uh, especially for people not familiar with film studies as a whole. They sure. wonder, what is film theory? What is uh, film theory? Well, Good in some question. ways, it's, it's the most basic question okay. uh, about, well, what is cinema? Uh, what defines cinema? in comparison to the other arts, mm -hmm. for instance. Those were some of the very basic questions asked in film theory at the beginning. Uh, it has progressed beyond that. So, uh, for instance, uh, later on, questions of, well, does cinema have its own language? Is cinema a language? How does cinema transmit meaning? How does meaning or signification occur within cinema? Mm -hmm. So there are many, many, many different, very fundamental questions about cinema. Uh, much of the Questions have evolved uh, around, uh, for instance, the issue of modernity. If cinema is a modern medium, what does cinema tell us about modernity? Uh, what does modernity tell us about cinema? Mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, while in film studies, you know, film theory is obviously one of the central aspects of the discipline, when you open a book, uh, giving you, uh, you know, the history of film theory or uh, some of the anthologies of the great writers in film theory. You never find anyone who's not an American or European. Right, okay. Uh, uh, that might be because no one else wrote about it, but it's not the case. I mean, especially when you look at Japan, Japan has a very long history. In fact, there were people who were writing books about cinema from a very philosophical or theoretical perspective, right. even before they were doing it in Europe. Okay. Uh, so cinema uh, has really have, has had a very, very vibrant history in Japan that has been accompanied by a theoretical endeavor, but that history has never been told. And that's mm -hmm. where you come in. That's where play. I come in, okay. yes. So. Um, when did Japan start doing cinema? When, when did they begin making films? Well, in general, most people date cinema uh, to 1895, which is when you had the first public performance of a projected uh, film, mm -hmm. uh, and that occurred in France uh, with the Lumiere brothers. And what was interesting about the Lumiere brothers is that they actually developed a camera that could also be a projector. Wow. Uh, and they sent cameramen around the world because then they could film things and then project them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as early as uh, 1896, 97, 98, uh, you already have people in Japan projecting film. So mm -hmm. in some ways, film uh, history begins in Japan at that time. Okay. Uh, but that was mostly foreign cameramen. Then it's really uh, past uh, the year 1900 that you start seeing more Japanese, but especially the film industry in Japan really, really gets going around uh, 1907, 1908. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's in 1914 that you already have uh, a wonderful book written by this fellow named Gonda Yasunosuke, 430 pages about cinema. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's about the technical aspects, but part of it is also he's really interested in a, how cinema is defining this new thing called modernity. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a really, really fascinating work. And it's before most of what was, most of what is canonized as like the first books on film theory in mm -hmm. the West. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so what will some of the issues be um, mm -hmm. that you will tackle in, in your book? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the issues is this whole problem about the kind of division that has been created in the history of film theory about how it has been concentrated on the West, as if in some ways only the West does 
film theory. Right. Uh, now, that's simply not a problem with the West. In some ways, that has also been something that Japanese thinkers have, for one reason or another, recognized. Okay. So even when you open books in Japan about the history of film theory, you don't find Japanese names. Uh, continue. And why do you think that is? Well, a part of it is that uh, even though, of course, Japan was never colonized by the West, uh, even though you could talk a little bit about what the occupation after World War II really mm -hmm. meant, nonetheless, uh, Japan was in some ways in a kind of neo-colonial perspective, in that, uh, especially as Japan opened up to the West, Western knowledge was considered superior oh, okay. to Japanese knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you have many intellectuals, not only in film, uh, but in many fields, who, for one reason or another, are always experiencing a kind of inferiority complex, that somehow what we are doing in intellectual endeavor is never quite enough to equal what the West is doing. Interesting. Uh, and that actually was one reason that Japanese film theory is actually quite interesting, quite different. Mm -hmm. Because you have these people who are actually writing extremely brilliant things about cinema, uh, in fact, broaching certain ideas before people in the West started broaching those ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're always doing it with the consciousness that what they're doing is not going to be recognized by the West. Mm -hmm. And it's that kind of complex in the multiple senses of that term. It, mm -hmm. Because it's very complex, but it's also a kind of like inferiority complex mm -hmm. that has led Japanese film theory to always be an investigation of theory as well. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of meta level to it, which I think has made it a very, very interesting theory, especially today, mm -hmm. because as film has essentially disappeared, it's now the digital age. Right. Films are no longer made on celluloid. Uh, that has created a crisis for film studies. Uh, In what way? Well, because you know, so much of our discipline has been centered around this photographic process okay. of celluloid with an emulsion receiving light and in some ways becoming an imprint of reality. But now things are made on digital to the point that sometimes you can see images which look real but were completely made inside the computer. Right. Uh, and that's just one of the many examples of the problems that the digital mm -hmm. has created. Uh, so in some ways film studies is rethinking its discipline as well as rethinking its history. Mm -hmm. And actually part of that process is rethinking film theory. Right. Uh, there is actually an organization, a worldwide organization, called the Permanent Seminar on the Histories of Film Theories, mm -hmm. which is actively looking at these film theories that have been ignored up until now. Right. In fact, starting today, the next session of the Permanent Seminar is going to be having a conference at Yale. Oh, great. Over the next couple of days, and I'll be participating just uh -huh. a little bit there. And will you be talking about uh, Jap you know, things going on in Japan? I will be obnoxious yeah. and insist on talking <laughs> about it. So good, yes, good. I will. Okay, um, you know, I am curious. You mm. are a Westerner. Okay, yeah. And you're writing this book mm. about, mm. Um, you know, the history of Japanese mm. film mm. theory. Mm. Um, are, will that, you being Western, mm. will that have any kind of role in, mm. in your perspective in the book? Well, it's always a, a issue that I have to deal with mm -hmm. as a scholar from the West. Mm -hmm. uh, but in some ways, it's always been an issue that I've dealt with because I actually lived in Japan for 12 years before coming to Yale. Uh -huh. um, uh, and I was very active writing many of my articles in Japanese. Uh, sometimes I felt that my position was not in Japan or in America, it was somewhere in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, probably mm -hmm. drowning somewhere. But uh, that I always had this kind of ambiguous position. Right. And it's one that I've, I th I've thought is actually kind of uh, productive, that I can actually use that position both to provide, or to provide an outside perspective, a critical pr perspective, not only on Japanese mm -hmm. cinema, but also on Western theory. Right. Um, and, you know, it's 
a good opportunity, I think, to do some interesting things because, frankly, most scholars in Japan have not thought about Japanese film theory. There's only one book that's been written about it mm -hmm. uh, by a great film critic named Sato Tadao. It's a very eclectic book. It's basically him picking a couple people who've written about cinema, but most of the time just talking about what he wants to talk about. Okay. Uh, it's still a very interesting book, but it's not really a good history. Okay. Uh, but I still run into many Japanese who say, what, there was film theory in Japan? I mean, that's the kind of complex that right. I'm dealing with. So in fact, it's actually good for me to be a Westerner, mm -hmm. uh, saying, well, actually, there's actually quite a lot there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and already some of the things I'm presenting, both in Japanese and English, are causing a lot of other people to start thinking about this. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of my projects beyond writing this history is actually to do an anthology. Okay. Uh, but what's interesting is that we've decided to uh, do an anthology both in Japanese and in English okay. because nothing has actually been produced in Japan on that. And it'll be uh, myself, another American scholar, and a Japanese scholar who mm -hmm. are the three editors. So it's very much an international endeavor and hopefully uh, it'll be an intervention mm -hmm. not only in Japanese film studies but also in American right, right. or European film studies. You know, I was going to ask you how will your book be unique from the others and, mm. and basically you've already answered the question, there are no others. There are no others. I mean, so, there, there have been some great uh -huh. uh, works in uh, Japanese film history or Japanese film studies which deal with particular periods or mm -hmm. particular issues which within that might take up some of these theorists. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, you know, this one is really going to be the first one that tries to deal with uh, the longer history mm -hmm. from supposedly the beginning t towards... Up to today or up well, to Well, that, that's the big problem of writing this because, you know, it, it helps when other people have done it before because they can choose or select what's the important thing mm -hmm. to talk about. Whereas with no other people writing about it, I've got to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it means, you know, I've got to go through literally thousands of articles mm -hmm. and try to figure out, well, what's important? What are the things that deserve being talked about in right. any history? Uh, where do you start? Where do you end? Uh, who do you include? Who do you not include? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of politics involved in that, which can be rather nasty and rather complex. Mm -hmm. I will probably be uh, criticized by lots and lots of graduate students in the future about mm -hmm. my selections. Sure. Uh, but uh, uh, nonetheless, I think it's very exciting because there's a lot of new ground to break. Mm -hmm. Kind of feel like a little bit of a pioneer sure. there. Sure, yeah, it's um, exciting. Yeah, and uh, Part of what I've decided to do, at least about when to end it, is to probably end around 1980. Okay. Uh, and why there? One reason being because, you know, really one of the great last film theorists, uh, Hasumi Shigehiko, that's really when he becomes very popular. So I might end with his work. Uh, but the other problem is, is that the people who are writing after that are probably all my friends. Okay or colleagues. Mm -hmm. And then you get into the problem of including and not including being a very personal issue. I see. Uh, so I kind of don't want to step on too many people's right, toes. Right. So I'll kind of arbitrarily kind of, but I think with some good reasons, end it around 1980. Okay. So. Now, does your research involve actually viewing any films? Mm. Well, I mean, that's one of the interesting things about uh, the Japanese uh, history of film theory. Mm -hmm. Because especially if these Japanese theorists were thinking about cinema in fundamental ways, but still working under a kind of oppressive condition where philosophy or thought or theory is a Western phenomenon, Japanese are not supposed to be doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, it sometimes has led Japanese to actually engage in other forms of theory, doing questions or pursuing questions of what is cinema in mm -hmm. fields not normally recognized as theory. For so, instance. So for instance in film criticism. Usually in the West we clearly divide film criticism and film theory. Uh, but in my case for instance, 
one interesting thing is that there are actually many pieces of literature which are actually very, very profound investigations of film. Mm -hmm. But also I think you can make an argument there are, are a number of films themselves that are actually very, very intriguing investigations of what is cinema. Okay. Uh, in part that comes from the fact that some of the great film theorists in Japan are actually some of the great filmmakers. Okay. Uh, I mean, you see this in Europe as well, less in America. Uh, but, you know, many filmmakers are actually quite intellectual and quite profound in thinking about their own discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, you could argue that all filmmakers, in some ways, are trying to think about what you can do in cinema. Mm -hmm. uh, but especially in Japan and in some places in Europe, some of them have actually wrote that down uh, on paper. Uh, and so you can look at those theorists and also at their films and really try to think about, well, what are they really saying about cinema? not simply in their words, but also in their images. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure how far along you are in the process with the book, mm -hmm. but for better or worse, have you come across anything that have, has surprised you mm -hmm. or something that you haven't expected? Yeah. Well, I mean, there are a number of things. I mean, obviously you come across some brilliant people. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of the great finds, uh, I think, has been this fellow named Nagai Michitaro, Mm -hmm. who is largely forgotten in Japan. He wrote just really one book, uh, plus a number of essays, but one book uh, called Form, Expression, and Formation, or Film, Expression, and Formation, okay. uh, which is brilliant. Uh, it's really one of the best books, I think, written on cinema anywhere. Wow. Uh, and especially uh, in the 1970s, 1980s, one of the great French philosopher Gilles Deleuze uh, wrote a book on cinema which especially talked about the issue of time in cinema. Mm -hmm. He is one of the representatives of a trend we call film philosophy, which is sometimes distinguished from film theory. That is, using cinema to answer fundamental questions about philosophy, okay. like what is time. Mm -hmm. But Nagai Michitaro in 1940 is basically talking about what Deleuze is talking about. 40 years before. I mean, obviously in a, a different way, but still in a really, really fascinating way. Mm -hmm. So there are these finds about, you know, really, really interesting people. But also I think, you know, there are trends throughout Japanese uh, film uh, theory which I think are very fascinating. Uh, for instance, uh, in American or European, especially British film studies, uh, it was from the 1970s that people really started thinking about spectatorship how spectators, the people who watch films, are actually very, very important in the process of film production. That they, in fact, are part of the process of creating the meaning of films. Mm -hmm. uh, but what's interesting is that in Japanese film history, especially this history of film theory, you see people talking about that from 1914, because that's, in fact, one of the main points of Gonda Yasunosuke. Mm -hmm. It's, he actually doesn't talk about individual films. He doesn't talk about directors. Because to him, it doesn't matter. It's the spectators who make films. And to him, that is the reason why cinema is modern. Because it is the sign, uh, in fact, the representative of the arrival of the modern masses. That they are going to be taking over culture. Mm -hmm. Because it is through their cinema viewing that they are creating culture. Which you cannot do with literature, you cannot do with theater. So cinema, to him, is the marker of a new civilization. Wow. And precisely centered around the activity of the spectator. And that becomes, I think, a trend. You see that uh, in other theorists in the 20s, 30s, 40s, into the post-war, who are very interested in this issue of spectatorship, which has not been a major issue in... Uh, Western film theory uh, necessarily in the same way uh, up until you know the 1970s. Well, it sounds like anyway. a fascinating project. Well, I wish you all the best well, with thank it. You. And mm. thank you so much for being here with us and sharing some of your work. Well, thank you for inviting me again. For more information about Professor Giroux and his research, please visit our website at yale.edu slash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us for, again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.